I'm Trey Hill from Maryland. Um, I was going to instead advance cover crops, and I, the, the program so far has been great, but I don't think anyone's really talked about yields for the most part. We keep hearing um, sometimes the yields are a little less, but you're making more money. Um, so I was going to kind of go through my philosophy of why we started cover cropping, why we're planting green, and then kind of dive into some of the, the pitfalls that I've had. Um, it's not all that rosy when you're starting out trying to figure this, this stuff out. We've suffered yield losses, we've suffered bugs, we've suffered a lot of different things. Not suffered, but been challenged by. And um, for the most part, it's been positive. Then I was going to go into some of the positives and probably share some yield maps, um, some things that we did this year, all based on 2017. We had a good year and um, got some real good data out of planting green. Um, so we, it's Harborview Farms. Um, we live in a very environmental area. So I've tried to brand the farm over the last 10 years to be more environmentally friendly. Um, we're fairly large scale, we're 10,000 acres plus. So kind of getting away from some of the societal things of you know big farmers being bad to kind of soften it. Um, we've, we started out with sustainable farming, kind of saying, yeah, we're sustainable, and then it, that kind of got confusing because everyone has a different interpretation. Then I went to responsible, and I said, well, we're responsible farmers, something everyone could relate to. And now I'm um, kind of trying to pull some more of the ecological aspects of it. So like as, as, people, as, as the farm evolves, um, so I think our new um, slogan is going to be ecological farming through technology which I think kind of sums up this whole program that we've been at the last couple of days is forming this ecology that we could never do before we had technology. And I don't think that the public really realizes this. So I think it's somewhat appealing as farmers go out into the into public and we start to speak to people and become more transparent with what we're doing and how we're doing it. It's important to talk about ecology and it's important to talk about technology because those are the stereotypes that work against farmers, particularly farmers that are cover cropping, planting green and building ecological systems in their soils. I think it's a really good point to bring out to people that don't farm, that sometimes don't really care for what we do with growing corn and soybeans. Um, so I'll get started with some of my background, hopefully. Um, this is a very beautiful picture to me. Um, this is how I grew up. That's, you know, that's near perfect. That's near a grain system. Um, that's full conventional. So I don't come from an a, um, environmental background. My father was, is still not a big soil health guy. Um, he's my equal partner in the farm. And I say I'm the CEO, but he's the chairman of the board. Um, he has veto power over everything. So what I've had to do is sell this philosophy of soil health and stuff to a guy that doesn't really care about it and still make money and be an equal partner. Um, so it's been a pretty tough sell. So my background's a little bit unique in that I'm not coming from, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the folks you see that are my age that are farming, their fathers were real into soil conservation. They were into this. Dad was on the soil conservation board and did waterways, but really not a, a true environmentalist. So trying to sell that to him, we've had to do it through, I've had to do it through yield and economics, right? So it's a little bit different background. It's not, you know, he's not looking at 10 years down the road and all that, you know, we're farmers, you know, we got to make money this year. You can always go out of business. He's a little pessimistic, a little doom and gloom. I have a lot of respect for him, but it's sometimes tough to work with, especially when you're trying to change the way you farm. Um, so we, we had, we've always no-tilled some, um, the challenging ground. Um, then we went to minimum till, we had turbo tills. Um, we've had two the maxes, we've had, um, the case 330 turbos, um, all of which are good products, but then we started getting compaction in the top. We thought with no-till we would get less compaction, we'd have more bugs, and we were building this environment. But without cover crops and with all this minimum till, we were really making a mess of our soils. We got away from the plow pan, and then we got a real hard layer at three inches. So if we got a cold rain, the seed sat in that three inches and died. So we figured we had to get away from that because then we were going back to plowing, and we just kind of had made a mess over the period of probably five to ten years on some of our best farms. So we kind of hit the reset button, started cover cropping, started planting green, and we've been slowly evolving um, through that. So this is kind of where the philosophy is, um, kind of where we are right now, is building the year-round system. I don't think I'm saying anything that hasn't been said by the last seven presenters here. Um, living roots all season long, healthy, efficient, responsible nutrient cycling. That's probably my biggest challenge right now, is figuring out this nutrient cycle. Um, we're still getting nitrogen loss in corn. I'll cover some of that later as I talk about some of the challenges. Um, never getting your hands dirty. I always like to walk in fields, um, and when you shovel, if the soil's healthy and you crumble it, your hands don't get dirty, or at least where I live, we don't have a lot of clay. But if you plow a field and it's wet and you go out in it, your feet get stuck, your boots fall off, the no-till ground, you walk right across it, you pick it up, I have you know, college kids and different kids come out to the farm, I take a shovel and I say, rub the, rub the soil in your hand, rub it on your pants. It comes right off because it has aggregate stability. So I think that's kind of a nice 
um, way to look at it, and then progressing through the use of technology for better fertilizer and pesticide utilization. Um, we're cutting back on a lot of our herbicides, particularly the weed killers, because we're getting uh, weed control. Um, it started, we don't keep very careful notes. Um, I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, it started with George, just a mistake. So I call all of our mistakes opportunities. So the opportunity was that we didn't spray the whole field, we had sprayed a portion of it, went to plant it, and this was before soil health had even come into my mind, um, but it was all based on agronomics. So once again, I'm kind of coming at it from a little different angle um, than some of the other folks here, but it worked out really well. So then we started saying, well, if we, if we planted it this year and it worked, what can we do next year? So each year we've been kind of trying a few new things and getting a little braver each year. And then we kind of hit that, hit a wall, and then we'll kind of take a different angle. So this year, this was this, was this year. Um, that rape seed is roughly as tall as me. Um, it was a mix of cereal rye, rape, clover, barley. Um, it was a cloudy day, it was kind of raining, so I had a um, good picture opportunity. But uh, starter tanks on the planter, and that's us planting corn um, in the rain. And normally we wouldn't plant in the rain, but since everything's green, we don't have any mud sticking to anything. The roots of the soil are keeping it kind of soft and, and supple, so Lee calls me, he runs the planter, he's been with us seven years, and he's like, Trey, you sure about this? I'm going to try it. It's raining. We want to get it done. It's a typical East Coast field. It's about 50 acres. It gets eaten by deer. It gets flooded. You know, it's just a, it's, the guys in the Midwest probably wouldn't till it. Um, I said, ah, you know, it's Friday. Let's go ahead and wrap it up that we don't have to work this weekend. Um, and I'll show you the yield map from this field later on. So I was a little nervous, um, a little scary to, to plant and stuff this tall. We've been doing it for a few years, but I'm still apprehensive. Um, it's still kind of hard to sleep. You know, you won't see the corn come up for about a month and a half. You can't row it for a month. So we, we roll or crimp this, um, killed a turkey in the process. <laughs> Didn't want to kill the turkey, but it is nice to see the ecosystem thriving, that there's turkeys out in my field running around eating the bugs. You know, so I'm like, well, you know, you can see the deer, but, you know, there's all kinds of wildlife in this stuff. And I think that all adds to the, the, the aura of it because it's, it's helping the hunters, it's helping the ecology, it's helping everything. And if we can just get it to yield. Um, so here's... Here's a few more pictures from this spring. If I can get it to work. There we go. Um, so this is what it looks like after we plant. Um, so keep in mind, I'm coming from a completely conventional background, clean fields, clean no-till, clean everything. And now we're planting into this. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, so this is where I view advanced um, cover cropping to be. The focus of mine is how tall can we get the stuff, how many roots can we get, and how much biomass can we accumulate on top of the ground and still plant and get good yields. Because I do think that whether it's carbonomics, whether it's um, living life, ecosystems, microorganisms, the more growth, the more sunlight we can use, the better off we are. Um, I'll actually get to that. We're using an 18-18-0, um, but nutrients are a big, are one of the key parts. That's where I made a lot of mistakes two and three years ago um, was within the starter. Um, so these are some mixes. I like to put clover with everything because you get nitrogen tie up with your cereals. Um, so to me, it was kind of a no-brainer. Let's mix some clover in. It's not that expensive. Back down on our cereals a little bit. Um, so you can see the, the crimson clover flowers there. Um, and I like rape. Rape's just nice. And then rape, rape also blooms early, so it's really pretty. Yeah, anything over about 18 inches we roll. Um, that's where we start to get the shade effect. Um, we've done that before. If the corn comes up and it's spindly and it starts to twist, you lose your ear mass and you lose your rows and you lose your, your columns. So anything over about 12 to 18 inches, we try to roll um, and crimp down just for shading because that was the lesson we learned in 15 <laughs> was the shading. Um, so then we kind of, for 15 and 16, we had some shading issues. We went to the crimper this year. This year we had some nitrogen issues. So we're kind of still... It's a work in progress. Um, and I'll kind of, this is kind of the challenges we've run into. Um, this year we were about 8,000, we did about 90% of our acres all green. Um, so we're getting some pretty good experience. Crimping, we were trying to figure that out. Um, we run 60 foot planters. So the question was, how do we, how do we crimp this with a 60 foot planter? We looked at the Dawn, Biolog Dawn biological system, but it doesn't fit on our planter, the make that we run. Um, so we built this crimper. I took an old um, Krauss cultivator and we put uh, stalk devastators on the back of it and then welded ridges to it to get the crimp. It works well. I like it because all the crimpers that I found and the rollers I found were rigid. 
Well, a lot of my fields have swells to them. You know, you have a sprayer track, you have this track, you have that. You, it, they're just not that smooth. You know, I like them to be smooth, but they're, you know, there's natural deviations in the soil. And if you don't crimp at all, you lose your consistency. You, then you lose your emergence. Then you get different heights of the corn, which then costs you yield. So I said, well, how can we build something with a parallel linkage that'll float with the ground like a planter, but still be able to crimp? Um, so we built this, and it worked pretty well. Um, the first trip down the road, it fell off the back of the tractor because the bolt broke, which was, was a little you know, unnerving. And um, we were thinking about putting weight, so we haven't quite figured out how to get enough weight on it. Because one thing I learned with the crimper is you have to be able to adjust the amount of pressure you have because the worst thing you can do when you crimp is to cut the stalk. If you cut the stalk, the weed comes back, the cereal comes back stronger than ever. Then you have to spray it again and it's very tough to kill. But so if we're doing barley that was planted at you know, 50, 60 pounds, you don't want a lot of pressure. If you're, if you're trying to go through this, I mean, that's a full size tractor, so that tire's this tall and we're trying to crimp it so the mat on the ground is, is three to four inches deep, I need more pressure. So we're, I think what we're gonna do this year is go to hydraulic down pressure and have a hydraulic pre cylinder on each one with a linkage, but the problem is I have to get enough carry within that pressure. You know, I've gotta build something with springs and a, a full lever mechanism in order to be able to accommodate the travel of the cultivator. Um, I don't think it'll be too bad. Um, and we had pretty good success with it this year, it did good, but I'd like, like that should be rolled down a little neater, a little cleaner. Um, Currently, we're going after the planters. Uh, going ahead of the planter, everyone says, just follow your planter. And I said, well, that makes sense. Well, first, I'm two different widths. I can't get a 60-foot crimper. I don't have a 60-foot cultivator. And we have auto steer, but then I said, what about the headlands? If you go into planting green and you don't plant your headlands first, your tractor runs over it, so when you do your headlands, you're going to cross every wheel track. Well, if it's this thick, there's not a planter in the world that can plant it, right? I mean, you, you, there's no colder that'll cut through four inch of green mass. I mean, then it's, you've just got a mess. So I said, well, why not crimp afterwards? Um, so our evolution with the crimping is we're crimping after the planter um, is kind of how we've evolved to it. We use auto steer, we can run the rows. And then my thought on it, as we get a little braver and a little more brazen in the whole crimping part, I think what we're gonna do is, is notch out the bars that we put on it. So that way if the corn comes up, because we're kind of taking a chance, you plant it and then you have to get it, we have to spray it and we have to crimp it. So we're kind of pushed for time, you get a rain, what kind of mess do we have? So I'm thinking we can cut like a two inch bar out of the notch out of the bars. So when we go to crimp it, we won't be touching the corn row. You know, right now we're running over the corn row and it doesn't really affect it. You know, you get a little indent in the ground, but not much. So I think if we notch that out, then we could go wait till it's two inch corn, roll it, crimp it then, and if we switch some to organic, which we're thinking about, we have a really good organic market, not a philosophical reason, but if we do to organic, if we go to organic and we're trying to no-till some organic, I think if we can roll or crimp this when the corn's three or four inches tall, not affect the corn, that's gonna buy us an extra three weeks of weed control in that organic system. Plus it's gonna crimp whatever weeds have come up because we're getting pretty good weed control. Um, one of the big issues we had early on was cereals, um, going to head and going to seed. So we were all barley, because it's cheap, it's easy, it's a very forgiving plant to plant into. And one of the reasons we started planting green to begin with was that the guys planting beans after barley were growing as good or better beans than their full season beans, because of all the cover, because it was a cover crop, essentially. And I said, well shoot, if we're planting all this barley for cover crop, we can actually plant our soybeans three weeks before we would harvest the barley, because we don't harvest barley because it's not worth much, and we'll actually beat the guys planting into this barley. It was kind of the original, you know, kind of the first thought process of planting green was, wait a second, if we can plant the barley at flag leaf or just at heading, I should get better yields than the guys planting after harvest because they're, they're taking it all, I'm planting three weeks earlier. So then we went all barley, all green, and then we had a wet spring and I'm planting into headed out, full seeded um, barley with my soybeans, which was fine. It was before we were crimping. Great, well then you go to harvest and you're harvesting beans and barley. <laughs> not a real good combination when you're going to Purdue to feed chickens and you've got barley in your beans. Um, we didn't do it on a lot of acres. It was just, you know, a couple isolated events, but a very good lesson learned um, for all that. So what we do now is we plant barley where we're going to seed our corn and beans first. Then we'll switch to cereal rye for our mid, kind of our mid planting window. The problem with cereal rye is if it gets this big, your corn won't do anything. It just, it ties up the nitrogen, it just really makes a mess. I mean, you can really, we've suffered some pretty good yield hits in small isolated incidents. So once we get through that middle window of planting in the fall for the spring, then we'll switch to wheat. 
Wheat's not quite as forgiving. You get a little more tie up in the soil, um, but it's manageable. But your maximum height's here, not here. So we've kind of, part of our advancement is figuring out what cereals to plant when and basing that not on our timing of planting of the cover crop, but when we intend to plant those fields in the spring. And it's not a perfect system. I mean, it, there, there's obviously pitfalls, but we typically know which fields are a little bit lighter soil that we can get on earlier, um, which fields we're gonna get on later. And we try to adjust our cover crop based on that. So as, as we're mixing the cover crop, we put clover and rape with everything, but we kind of alternate the cereals based on where we want to plant them. And like I said, if you get a, a bad um, spring where it's wet, then everything kind of gets tall and then you just have to deal with it. But it actually plants better. Um, another problem we've had is glyphosate, glyphosate resistant weeds getting too big to kill. Um, we have a lot of mare's tail. We've got a little bit of pigweed. Um, it's been a real challenge, but we figured out how to manage it through chemistry. Um, we're using a lot of residual herbicides on our beans. Uh, the problem is if the mare's tail gets over about six inches tall, there's really not anything that will kill it in beans unless you go to dicamba beans. Um, the Liberty is typically, glufosinate is about four to six inches where we can get kill. Sharpen is about six, maybe up to eight. So if the, if the mare's tail get to 20 inches in the spring and you're out there planting beans, you really run out of options. Um, so what we've done for that, and then I'll, I'll go over the planters with the fertility and the starters and what we're doing there. Um, so what we've done now is when we do our burn down, we pull the glyphosate out. So we're putting down our residuals with a little bit of 2,4-D. We're getting the mare's tail knocked out, but we're letting the barley grow. We're letting the cereal grow. That's keeping us planting green. And we only do this on fields when we're scouting. You know, we look for mare's tail. We look for pigweed. If we've got it, we know it's going to get big. It's a later planted field. So this picture is my soybeans right here in a row coming up next to a stunted by 2,4-D barley. The other advantage of the 2,4-D is that it will stunt the barley by about two to three weeks. So it'll knock a cereal back. So if you're worried about it going to head and you know it's gonna be a couple weeks before you can plant it, if you think about it, you can go out and nail it with 2,4-D, you take out your broad leaves, you've still got your leg, your legumes will die, but you've still got the nitrogen there because they're gonna be a while breaking down because you're not doing tillage. You've still got that available for your plant but you avoid that, that window where everything's heading out and you've got a big mess. So as the spring's gone, it's gotten a little wet, we're behind on planting. All right guys, let's go out and hit some dicamba 2,4-D. Two to three weeks ahead of the window, they're not dicam they don't have to be dicamba beans. You knock out your mare's tail, you knock out your broad leaves, plant your beans, and then you can come back anytime and kill that. I mean, that barley's easy to kill. Um, there's nothing to it. You know, a really inexpensive shot of uh, glyphosate will knock it right out and your beans come on through. Um, the other thing we found is that looking at, at covers and trying to figure out what complements what. Um, I think it's kind of common or kind of logical to think that grasses compete with grasses, right? If you look at the prairies, grasses always competed with grasses and they didn't really compete with what was down on the ground. So we've been trying to plant cereals with corn where it's grass on grass. And I think that's where a lot of the yield drag comes from because they're all competing for those same nutrients. So finding covers, um, beans do great. And then I'll, I'll move on to the starters. With all the nitrogen tie-up that everybody's talking about, it's very true, um, the carbon to nitrogen ratios. So we used to have a, a boot that came out near that Keaton seed firmer that would inject the, the fertilizer into the side trench. Um, it's made by a guy, Huckstep in Nebraska. And we were running about 10 gallons of an 820 or an 825, kind of heavy on phosphorus, and we had zinc boron and sulfur with it. it worked great for years. Well, all of a sudden we started planting green and our corn was coming up yellow. I was like, oh, you know, there's no nitrogen left in the soil at planting, whereas normally we have all this residual end from the year before. Now we've pulled it all up, which is good, but we're penalizing it. So we went to the Martin system. It's putting it two inches over um, and directly beside the seed. We didn't go down because we didn't want it to bounce the units up on rocks. And we've gone to um, 20 to 25 gallons, of 18, 18, zero. So that's given us about 45 pounds of N, 45 pounds of phosphorus, because we're trying to counteract that, site, that nitrogen tie up from the cereals. So we're, we're spoon feeding it. And that's where a lot more of my nitrogen's going down. Now when my corn comes up, it's, you know, it's got the normal greenness, it's dark, it's rich, and we've got the cereals around it. Um, closing wheels, I'm not real sold. We've tried everything um, under different environments. Some work better than others. Um, here's our deer planter. I like these, they're kind of a double paddle. Um, I think they're Mart Yetters, I think, I'm not sure. They came out with them two years ago. They're cast, so we're getting more pressure than we used to like, but the double spikes, we had trouble with closing the trench if it got a little wet. And the greener you get, the harder it is to close the trench. Um, the trench is malleable, it's soft, but it, it kind of slices together. Um, the case system, we run a case plant or two. I really like the case system. 
um, for shallow planted, but as you plant deeper corn, it gets tricky too. This one, this one we've been pretty happy with, and I like the paddle wheel behind it. Unfortunately, um, George doesn't like it, and George runs the Kinsey, and this is what George likes, and uh, I've worked with George all my life, so I don't fight with him. Um, this, as we discussed, discussed yesterday, these have been kind of my nemesis. Um, Joanne Whalen's our exten extension entomologist who's now working for me in her retirement as a crop scout. So we're scouting slugs um, regularly. They're pretty easy to scout for. Um, you put a shingle out in the field, you put a red flag around it, you go out and you check them. They're very difficult. If you don't put out a trap, slugs are very difficult to scout for because they're only out in the morning. So you've got about two hours where you can actually scout to do slug counts. Um, so we put shingles everywhere, we chart them, we graph them, we figure out where we've got higher numbers, and those fields will just automatically spread with slug bait. Or we'll use a suspension fertilizer, um, suspended potash, if you have access to a liquid fertilizer dealer that does a suspension. Um, the salts and the suspended potash work really well if you've got like three or four days of sun coming. Um, and we found that actually eats a lot of them up. So that's kind of been our strategy for that. Um, but yeah, they're a mess. I mean, I've seen them take down five leaf corn and just wipe them out in like a. We've seen a lot of copper out here. In, in, out of, you know, guys I've talked to that have talked I saw the research that was alluded to yesterday from Penn State. And when I read it, I didn't feel like it had been replicated many times. Um, so I kind of tossed it aside until they get a little more research. I asked Joanne about it. She didn't really agree with it. Um, but based on what I heard yesterday, I'm probably going to try it. Um, I've actually gone to a higher rate <laughs> of neonics on my seed because now that we're planting all the flowers um, with the rape and the clover, I'm trying to pull my pyrethroids out of my, out of my herbicide application because I don't want to kill all the bees. You know, I'm trying to build bee habitat and ecology and then I'm going out and putting a blanket coat of pyrethroid on with my gramoxone and my atrazine, and I'm going, wait a second. If I'm attracting all these bees and feeding them and it's a great feel-good, I can't go out and kill them all the next day. Um, so my strategy was to put a higher rate of the neonic on and then, in turn, be able to pull my pyrethroid out. Um, we also have pockets of grubs, and grubs are pretty darn difficult. Japanese beetle grubs uh, can really decimate a crop. You know, they'll take out a whole section and you can't really scout for them because you got to dig. You know, you don't know it until the, you know, the corn comes up and it dies. So you can be scouting and scouting and scouting and everything looks great. But with the grubs attack it, then what do you do? You've got to replant it, but you're, you're three or four weeks behind because you couldn't have detected it before, you know, unless you dig every section and there are hot spots. You know, the, 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 the larvae will be in different parts of the field. So I'm still a little apprehensive to, to pull my seed coatings out. I'm not saying right or wrong, but um, I probably should. Really? So, well, there's, <laughs> maybe I should try it. <laughs> the so, those have been kind of all my challenges. And so now that everybody's, you know, kind of convinced not to plant green, <laughs> um, kind of go into why I'm still planting green. Because, you know, what kind of idiot would still do this with all these headaches, fighting with his father? You know, my father's, you know, fighting me every day. Why are we doing it? This, this is kind of the basics of planting green. This is a no-brainer. This is easy. If you're planting the corn early, you're planting into this, that plant's great. Um, so here's kind of the key points. Um, the advantages of planting green, planting early, weed control, healthier soil, erosion control, and then for probably the biggest reason, higher yields. Um, that's something I think that gets glossed over in the soil health conversation is you can, I can grow more soybeans and corn planting green than I can planting them brown. Um, the planting early, we tried this a couple years, 15 was the first year we did it. And um, we went out in March, guys were starting to plow and disc and it was, it was about March 29th, their normal planting dates April 10th to 15th. And I said, well, we can't disc, you know, we didn't have anything to do. We're spreading a little bit of fertile, we can't spread fertile. Yeah, we were waiting on fertilizer, we were spreading some fertilizer. We're standing around the shop. Um, we just put Delta Force on one of the planters, and I said, well, let's go out and try the planter. We'll just, we'll just do 100 feet. And then in my typical style, the guys that work with me all know this, they load the truck up with corn, they load the planter up because they know we're going to plant. <laughs> they hook the other planter up, so we're going to run, we're not going to run one planter, we're going to run two. 
Um, so March 28th, we went ahead and planted about 500 acres, um, which was probably dumb by any, I mean, people were taking pictures of me. I mean, I was on Facebook on other farmers posts, you know, look at this idiot. And uh, which is, you know, I figured that's good. You know, I mean, that means I'm doing something. Um, and uh, yielded great, you know, we planted it and I said, well, I'm gonna wait to spray it. We'll keep it green, that way the roots are there. That way if we get the hard rain, if we get, a, a, we get rains out of Canada, they come down to Maryland, they hit the soil, they zap it, you know, I mean, it just, it, the temperature goes straight down. So I said, we'll try it. You know, it's a good experiment. Nothing else, we'll replant it. Pioneer pays for your replant. They don't ask you if you were an idiot when you planted it. They just, you know, they cover it, you know. So I said, ah, we'll go for it. Um, got the planter set, got the delta force working, the auto steer work, and all that good, you know, all the technology usually takes us a day to iron out. Um, yielded 200 bushel, you know, picked it in late August, hit a nice early market, got a decent premium for it. We didn't have quite enough storage that year. It was a good year. So I was like, wow, this is great. We'll try it again. Um, so we've been doing it for three years now. I'm still not doing all of it. This year we had to replant 100 acres of it. Um, it just got the slugs and bugs and kind of just got funky on us. Um, the stand wasn't there. We were down to like, we'd planted like, we'd dropped like 32, 34 on average and we were down to like 25, 26. But we still had plenty of time to replant. So it wasn't, wasn't a complete loss. Um, the f other 400 acres this year did well again. Um, so I think that the, the, the planting green gives you the ability to plant as early as you would in conventional, um, but as a no-tiller, which always drove, drove me nuts. No-tilling was having to wait. You know, that's why we would just plow just because we got to dry the soil out because somebody else is planting. We better get going. You know, we don't want to look slack. Um, so I'll, what, what did you do to replant? Yeah, we let it get up to like five leaf. We, we planted it and then we had to wait a little while. I think it had just spiked or was maybe like single leaf, hit it with chromoxone and burned it off. Mm -mm. If, it, if it's green, when we were planting all no-till, I think dealt, and what we still burn, we still burn off some of our corn just because I haven't got quite enough nerve and I lose too much sleep. But um, the soil becomes more consistent when it's green. In a straight no-till, we've always got sprayer tracks, you know, grain wagon tracks, combine tracks, tractor trailer tracks. The Delta Force really pays there. You know, I mean, you can see it on the map where the sprayer sprayed this way and we planted this way and you can see every sprayer track. A lot of those tracks and stuff disappear when it's green and you can get away with a little more down pressure. You don't have to be quite as selective in your downforce because you're not getting as much sidewall compaction. Um, so I'm down, I'm getting close on time, so I'll buzz through this. So you guys remember the picture of the John Deere planting into the rapeseed and look like shit and neighbors are talking about me. Is that my home farm? Even my son's asking me about it. He's eight and he's like, Dad, you sure about this? <laughs> and my wife's like, what are you doing? This is where we live, you know? People are gonna see it. Um, but if you look at this yield map, the bottom part, this is where we have deer. That was a sunflower patch for dove hunting. This is a deer hunting patch or a goose hunting patch. It's an impoundment. But right here is where the picture was taken. So that was running in the, you know, this dark green area is 257 to 300. Um, the light green is 210 to 257. So, I mean, it can be done. And I don't think if it had been, if it had been brown or plowed, I wouldn't have grown 250 bushel corn on this farm. I mean, it's, it, that's only six acres of it. And the red, you just have to blotch out because if you're from the Midwest, you don't recognize fields that look like this, but it's fairly typical for me in the East. So our averages obviously aren't that. I mean, but it was, I was pretty tickled. I was like, that's pretty cool. You know, if I can grow 250 bushel corn planting into this mess, the soil's getting healthier and the biomass that I'm accumulating is great. You know, we're getting two, three, four tons. You know, can we hit five tons and still grow a good crop? Um, oh, good, 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 I, I, good. So you feel my pain, yeah. When people talk about average of 250, I'm like, nah, nah, it doesn't happen on my farms. Um, this was beans. Um, this field had a lot of blue, blue grass in it and it had beat, beat my cover crop. The cover crop was planted two different times. So I said, well, we better spray it before it goes to seed just so we don't get that seed bank built up. So we'll plant it brown and we'll plant this with cereal rye on the left. That's our, one of our pivots. And we planted it about three weeks later. So the cereal rye was about this tall. Um, it was straight cereal rye planted into it. And I said, ah, let's see what the difference is. You know, it's about a 400 acre field. This is one of our few good fields. Um, so here's the yield map. This red's where we were picking around the pivot. So the, uh, that's kind of combine noise. But if you look right here is where the picture was taken. So right here, the green, that's all 85 bushel plus beans planted into rye this tall. The red is an orange and yellows are 65 to 80. So if I'd sprayed the whole field and grown 70 bushel beans, I'd have been tickled, right? You know, that, that's great for us. This is an anomaly to grow 90 bushel beans where we are. Um, nothing special on it. We do a little bit of starter on our beans, um, a little bit of potash, and that was it. And, but you can see the clear, clear 
difference between green and brown, which shocked me. I was like, wow. But if I hadn't done it, I'd have been perfectly happy with 70. You know, I'd been, you know, hey, Dad, we're 70 bushel. You know, that's great. Don't tell anybody. Um, but instead, you know, we're hitting the 90s in the green side. I'm going, oh, we screwed up. We're only getting 70 over here. And uh, everybody's looking at me like I'm nuts. Um, so the corn plot, I'll go over this one. This was another test plot. We're doing research with the University of Maryland, Ray Wiles, who's here, Steve Mursky, who's here. We've been bringing in, people are getting attracted to me because we're doing this stuff. So, you know, kind of building the network of positive people like um, was alluded to yesterday. So this is a plot, it's a 120 foot wide strip in the middle of the field, that's where our sprayers are. Um, this had just been planted, so it's zero rye about 18 inches, which was above where I wanted it to be. Taller, I was worried about shade. We tried to crimp it, but we couldn't crimp it, it wasn't tall enough. It will only crimp once it gets lignin in it, so if it's still grassy, you run over and it pops right back up. So we're like, oh shoot, this is an irrigated field, we don't have much irrigation, so you know, we, you know, that's sacred, you know, you don't want to screw up your irrigated. I was like, well, you know, it's done. We're going, you know, we'll burn it off. We'll use gramoxone instead of glyphosate. You know, hopefully it'll melt. Um, it melts a little quicker. Um, so here's the yield map. So I blocked out the blued out the uh, sprayer strip, which I was concerned about. Here the green under the pivots running anywhere from 250 to 320. Um, so it was averaging about 280. Um, so I was worried. I was like, oh no, you know, where this blue strip is, I'm going to have a really hard lesson learned here. You know, I was thinking 30, 40 bushel off of what it would have been where it was brown. I can't see a difference. Um, it looked way different growing. Um, what was planted green was much prettier. It was greener, it was lusher, it was taller. But then once it got about yay tall, it started to show the symptoms of nitrogen deficiency. So we shot a little bit of nitrogen through the pivot, not a whole lot, put another 30, 40 pounds out, and it completely offset that, that, that tie up. Um, so I was kind of tickled with that. That was a good learning point for me. That's why I'm sharing this one. Um, then this one, we were spraying early. Uh, the pump broke in the sprayer here. This was a field we were going to plant brown. It's one of my later planted fields. Like I said, we're still 10, 15% brown, just, just out of nerve. Um, so we sprayed it like this. That was, you know, full rate of Lexar, Gramoxone, Atrazine, Metallichlor, and, and a PPO inhibitor. Let it grow, planted the corn, let the corn come up. I said, how far can we push it? I know I was going to learn a lesson, but I figured let's, let's see how many bushels it actually is. So the corn was about a foot tall, and we went out and sprayed it with uh, glyphosate and Callisto. You know, just blanket coverage, knocked it out of the park. And you can pretty well see that there's a pretty significant difference right there, right? The, 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 the light green is, is 250, the yellow is about 150. So there's really room to make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> this field's small, I mean, the whole field's eight acres, so it wasn't, um, yeah. Are you having any issues getting the free marks down to the ground? Not in corn, in beans, I struggle with it with mare's tail. Um, the, the, I'm having trouble with some of the residuals in beans. Corn, um, we use atrazine and metallichlor, and you know, we're putting it on at such high rates that we don't really have any issues, and by the time you burn it off, there's enough shade to keep anything from coming up because we got gramoxone with it. The beans, I'm still having a little bit of trouble because if the mare's tail is big enough and you don't kill it, then it's kind of tough. Um, yeah, we've gone to about 30 or 40 gallons with our beans, um, especially in cereal rye where it's real tall, like the picture with the crimper. Um, yeah, we're going to a higher rate of carrier. And with the corn, a lot of times we're putting our suspensions down with the Lexar. So if you're putting 70, 80, 80 gallons of, of uh, um, suspension down, you get good coverage. So this was kind of a neat one. Um, anyway, so like I said, we're doing some research. I think I'm just about out of time. Um, let's see. But the research has been pretty cool. This is a picture from on top of my leg. So this is the strips we did with Ray uh, last year. So this was kind of a, a that's a Chesapeake Bay behind us. That's Harbor View is because we've got a harbor next to us. Um, so we're always linked into the water and linked into where nitrogen's going. So these are, it was 15 strips. It was a five strip trial replicated three times. Ray said, hey, can you do a little experiment for me? And he shows up with this. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, it took like a day to plant it, a day to spray it. But I was a team player, so I went, went along with him. So anyway, so he has these grad students out there and they're putting you know, two feet lysimeters in the ground to, to track uh, nitrogen going into the water. And this was the four strips that had cover are this one, this one, this one, and this one. The one with no cover is the NC is this one. And it, that's nitrogen. That's nitrogen going through the ground at two feet deep. That's nitrogen destined for the groundwater or the bay, depending on which way you view the aquifer. It's an un, you know, it's a, a um, un, undefined aquifer. So it's either going to the bay or going into drinking water. So with that, I was like, well, that's kind of a nice added benefit. Um, then kind of one of the, um, kind of get into my philosophy on cover crops and soil health. I thought that was a neat picture. I took this with my kids. This is the Berlin Wall. 
And uh, this is at the, uh, they have like a mile of it up with all the paintings on it. And I thought that was a pretty cool quote. This is for people that have just come out of communism. So they're quoting things that are pertinent to that, which isn't really pertinent to soil health. But I was like, that's a pretty cool, you know, starting point, a building block is many small people who in many small places do many small things that can alter the face of the world. And I really think with soil health and with cleaner water, cleaner everything, and if I can sell my father on it, you know, I think we can really make some changes. So it kind of keeps me motivated, um, keeps me motivated to let my kids know. And then that's it. Thank you.